As I said earlier, we are in 1 John chapter 5, and I've spent a little extra time in these last few verses of the last uh, chapter as John has been writing to the church. And the reason I've done this is because, well, there's, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's also a lot of difficult stuff in these last few verses. And so I'm going to spend some time this morning just on two verses, verses 16 and 17. Next week, we're going to be looking, if you wanted to just kind of devotionally read through these verses, we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 20. And then I'm going to do something that I rarely ever do in the last sermon of this series. I'm going to preach on just a single verse, which I don't do very often, but it's kind of interesting that as John is finishing this letter, he doesn't give us a, a farewell necessarily. He just kind of ends with, with kind of an abrupt a sentence in 1 John chapter 5, and so I want us to spend some time on that particular verse and kind of why John ends this letter with that. So that's kind of where we're at. But today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. If you have your electronic devices, you're welcome to look up those verses. We're going to have those on the screen for you as well. Or if you like the paper version, which I like, I prefer, uh, that's where we're going to be at today. Every two years, the federal government asks thousands of teenagers dozens of questions to see if they are all right. Beginning in 1991, it has sent the Youth Risk Surveillance Survey to more than 10,000 high school students to ask about bad behaviors. It's essentially asking, how much trouble are you getting into? And the results may surprise you. If you compare their answers to those of their parents in the early 1990s, the answer is really not much at all. Most of the survey questions show that today's teenagers are among, now get this, the best behaved on record. I know, laugh if you will. Just go ahead. Give, give it a good belly laugh this morning. But statistically, I'm going to share these things with you. 10.8% of teens today smoke cigarettes. 20 years ago, 34.8% of high school students did. So we've made, some, we've made some, some progress in the area of some personal habits. Teenagers today are 46% less likely to binge drink than teenagers 20 years ago. I'm just telling you the statistics, whether it's true or not. This is what they're, this is what they're saying. In fact, they're 21% less likely to have, ever, to have ever tried alcohol at all. In 1996, 5.6% of teen girls had babies. Now that number is 2.3. They're less likely to fight at school and more likely to wear a seatbelt. They carry weapons to school less than the teens of generations past. Now that may be something have something to do with some of the past, uh, you know, things that have happened in our country. It may be due to the fact that, well, they may actually enter high schools that have metal detectors. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why they may not carry weapons to school, but I'm just telling you this, the statistics. Uh, but there are, of course, ways kids these days are behaving more poorly. So we don't want to give them just, you know, kudos for everything that they've done, right? Uh, for instance, vaping is a new and significant public health challenge with more than four in ten students having used tobacco that way. So maybe that's where the transference of cigarettes to vaping comes in. And so they're smoking less cigarettes, but they're vaping more. Teens today eat fewer vegetables than the teens of yesteryear. They spend more time in front of computers, obviously, and they've become just slightly less inclined to wear sunscreen. <coughs> and then, of course, there's also texting and driving, which we're not even going to mention today. So I want you to think about that this morning as we look at these last two verses, or these two verses, verses 16 and 17 in chapter 5 of John. Because as John is finishing this letter, he again turns to a subject he has written about previously, bad behavior. And he's asking us today, how much trouble are you getting into? 
Is our sin leading to death? Let's read these two verses this morning. Verses 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not... Now, yours might say not leading to death, but you can just take out that leading. That, that's a, it's kind of a, an add-on. They're giving us a, an interpretation of what the word's actually saying. So if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not to death... And we're going to look at that in just a few moments. He shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not to death. There is a sin to death, or leading to death. I do not say that he should make request of this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not to death. Let's pray together, and then we'll see what John has to say to us today. God, we come to this, uh, these two verses in Scripture, and they, they seem to us to be difficult to understand. And we have to ask ourselves, what is John, what is he moving us to in this, in this text of Scripture? What's the truth that he wants us to know from these verses? So today we're going to visit the subject again of, of sin. I want you to remind us that, that as we've prayed today in, in, uh, for needs of our church, I want you to remind us today that oftentimes the needs that we pray for, physical needs, are important. And they need, they, they're the things that surface to our hearts. But I want you to remind us today, God, to pray for those who are in sin. I ask God that we would begin to look at our brothers and sisters in Christ that are here today or that maybe we work with, or that are a part of a different church, and, and understand that if they are struggling today in sin, that our responsibility as believers is to pray for them, that you would give them life. And so today we come, we ask your word to be given to us today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Call it transgression, addiction, Missing the mark, misstep, iniquity, a foible, we don't use that one very often, unrighteousness, blunder, or disobedience. The terms don't fool anyone. You see, we can use euphemisms, or we can change the semantic, or we can give a synonym for that word, but sin is sin. The Puritan John Bunyan meant no words when he defines sin as, now get this, the dare of God's justice, the rape of his mercy, the jeer of his patience, the slight of his power, and the contempt of his love. Now I want to say those again because I want you to just take those home this morning. What a great way to represent, to give us a picture of sin in our lives. The dare of God's justice, the rape of his mercy, the jeer of his patience, the slight of his power, and the contempt of his love. If we say we don't have a sin, we're kidding ourselves and are not truthful. You see, John, early in this letter, reminded us that we all have a sin problem. And I think that's why John is writing this to us as he's finishing up this letter, because we all have a sin problem. And God reminds us one last time of the deadly effects of sin. I mean, these two verses have caused some to scratch their heads and, and others to shrug their shoulders and I'm going to tell you right now, it's, these two verses have caused some preachers just to avoid them altogether. And when they come to this text, they just kind of gloss over it. They don't really want to talk about it because it's a hard text of Scripture to understand. I mean, the question is, what is a sin to death? What is a sin to death? I mean, is this a cryptic message from John to believers of his day or to those who would try to decipher it later? Is that what it is? I mean, we're looking to some of this text in Revelation, and this is just kind of foretaste of some of the things that we're going to see in Revelation. I mean, is that what it is? I mean, I think 
That's kind of like us. We just kind of want to not talk about it or think about it. I mean, is he referring to what we call the unpardonable or unforgivable sin of Matthew 12, 23? Mark 3.29, Luke 12.10. Is that what he's talking about here? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Is the death that he writes about, now get this, is the death that he writes about physical death or spiritual death? In the scripture, when we think about those terms, and when the Bible uses the word death, it really doesn't, I mean, it's the same word. Physical death, spiritual death, what's he talking about? I mean, there are some of the questions, those are some of the questions that, well, as I was studying this week, John Calvin and Warren Wisby and John Stott and Chuck Swindoll uh, and others, they've, they've answered those in commentaries and in sermons. But So we ask ourselves this morning, what is sin to death? And there have been at least four interpretations as to what John meant. And I'm going to share those just briefly with you, and then we're going to get to what we need to look at in this text of Scripture. Some say this is the sin of a, it's apostasy. But, you know, not backsliding, but a complete denial of Jesus and faith. Some say this is a sin so terrible it is unforgivable. And that list includes, but it's not limited to, and this is what some commentators have said, suicide, murder, idolatry, even adultery. But you see, the only problem with that is that Paul tells us the Corinthian church was filled with some of these very people. And he says they were washed and they were sanctified and they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. So I don't really think that's what John was saying here, that this is a a sin that's so terrible that it's unforgivable. And that really gives us a sigh of relief, doesn't it, this morning? And we're all kind of breathe easy. Because if we're involved in some of those things or have been involved in some of those things, we've been washed. We've been justified. We've been sanctified. I mean, those are the things that God has removed from us. And so we say, amen. Amen. All right. Okay. Still others say, as we said, that this is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this was the deliberate, open-eyed, flagrant sin of the Pharisees who said Jesus' teaching and miracles were from Satan and not the Holy Spirit. Don't ever say that one. That's an uh uh-oh and a no-no. But I want you to remember what John has written. He penned this letter so that we may not sin. I mean, he penned this letter so that we may not sin. He encourages us that... No one who is born of God practices sin. He will tell us next week that no one who is born of God sins. Because as believers, we have been given a new nature. As believers, we have new desires. As believers, we have new appetites, and our interest in sin is exchanged for the things of God. Yet we are warned that the Christian faces, well, three enemies, all of which want to lead us into sin. And we looked at that in John as well. You remember that a few sermons ago? The world, the flesh, and the devil? I mean, that's what we're up against today. So this morning, I want you to understand something as John is pinning this to us. Though we have a new nature, we don't always and won't always yield to it. Now think about that today. Though we have a new nature, we don't always and won't always yield to it. I mean, it's easy for us to yield to the desires of the flesh. Let's be honest with ourselves today. I and mean, that's easy. It's easy for us to yield to the desires of the eyes. It's easy for us to yield to the pride of life. I mean, the atmosphere around us makes it hard for us to keep our minds pure and our hearts true to God. Whatever we say and however we want to use it, whether we talk about our life in terms of 
the narrow way or the broad way. We know that the broad way leads to destruction and the narrow way is the one that leads to life. But we understand how difficult it is to stay on the straight and narrow, don't we? And we understand these texts of Scripture because we live these things. And we understand that, that those three things, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eye, and the boastful pride of life, those are all a part of us. Paul told us this truth. And this is where I want you to go as we're leading into this idea of what is the sin to death. Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now let's look at that again. Let me read it. I'll slow it down. Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We're all there together. Notice all the alls in that text of Scripture. John tells us there is a sin to death. Now, I thought about that this week, and here's the truth that I came to. I don't think that he's telling us this is a specific sin, but I think he's telling us it's a kind of sin. Let's look at that for just a moment. And the truth is, the Bible mentions people who died because of their sin. Remember Nadab and Abihu? You're going to have to brush off your Old Testament. You know, you've probably not been there for a while, so dust it off. The two sons of Aaron the priest, they died because they deliberately disobeyed God. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. Go back and check it out. Or how about this one? Korah and his clan opposed God, and, and they died. In fact, I think if you go back to that text, if I remember correctly, check this one out for me. Number 16, I think that wasn't, wasn't Korah the one that the earth literally opened up and swallowed them whole. I mean, just because they wouldn't follow God. Achan was stoned because he disobeyed Joshua's orders from God at Jericho. A man, a man named Uzzah touched the ark and God killed him for simply touching his ark. And if we think that only happened in the Old Testament, let's not forget Ananias and Sapphira came together to conspire a plot to cheat the church and get ahead. Would you like to sing with me in children's church? <laughs> they knew God's power but didn't fear it, tried to cheat the Holy Spirit, went into the temple, and they both dropped dead. Remember that one? Oh, I love that. That's a great one. Oh, that's a, that's a favorite children's shirt song right there. Let's send that one home with our kids today. So I thank Children's Church for that song. Some believers at Corinth died because of the way they had acted at the Lord's Supper. Go back to 1 Corinthians 11.30. There it uses the euphemism, they fell asleep. But I think really what he's talking about there is that they misused the Lord's Supper and they died for it. So with Nadab and Abihu, it was, now look at this, with Nadab and Abihu, it was their presumption in taking the priest's office and entering the Holy of Holies. That was their sin. In the case of Achan, it was covetousness. That was his sin. Uzzah, though his intentions were pure, forgot that he was in the very presence of God as he tried to steady the Ark of the Covenant. Now think about that. The right intentions, doing the right thing. And yet God was God. And he was in the presence of God, and God struck him dead. So here's the truth this morning. Christians aren't people who never sin. We are, our, we are a people who, who hopefully do our best to avoid sin. I mean, hopefully we're a people that when we get in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God begins to work in us, that He transforms us. 
We talk about that transformative power of God in our lives. And so hopefully we are a people who do our best to avoid sin. Because we are a new creation and we are washed and we are sanctified and we are justified and we are born of God. But here's the thing that we often forget. When we come together in our prayer time, and here's my challenge for you this morning. When we see a brother committing a sin not to death, the challenge is, do we pray for him or her? Because you see, I think we're like Stephen Cole as he is talking to us about this text of Scripture. John doesn't say, if anyone sees his brother sinning, go tell the pastor so he can deal with it. Nor does he say, if anyone sees his brother sinning, call up all of your friends and tell them about it so they can pray. You see, that's a thin spiritual cover-up for gossip. Nor does he say, if anyone sees his brother sinning, he should shake his head in disgust and ask, how could he do such a thing? That's called judging your brother. Rather, he says that if you see a brother in sin, pray for God to give life to him. While we are all responsible for our own sins, only God can truly deliver us from sin. Because only God can impart life. So we're dependent on God to deliver, but at the same time, the sinning brother is responsible to turn from his sin and take the necessary steps not to fall into it again. And there is the challenge for us today. Before we speak to a brother about his sin, we need to speak to God about the brother. Because prayer is essential in restoration of them. So there's my challenge for us today. Instead of going to the preacher, instead of telling our friends, instead of shaking our head, Let's pray for them. And let's pray together.